Now, as it happens, today is Constitution Day, and that's a coincidence, but a happy coincidence, because of course, for Judge Williams, the Constitution was the foundation of his work, and really clearly so in his judicial opinions and his scholarly writings. And so our second panel will focus on Judge Williams' understanding of the Constitution, of federalism more specifically, and his broader writings on liberal democracy and liberal reform. Now, in a moment, we'll hear from Professor Grieva and Mr. Zelensky, but our first speaker today is Stephen Sachs the Antonin Scalia Professor of Law at Harvard Law School. Unfortunately, he couldn't join us in person today, but he recorded a video in tribute of the judge for whom he clerked. And so if we can now see the video. Good afternoon. My name is Stephen Sachs. I was fortunate enough to clerk for Judge Williams in 2007 and 2008, and I am very grateful to have the chance to speak to you today and to participate in honoring, remembering, and once again, learning from Judge Williams. I'm very sorry that I was not able to travel to join you in person, but fortunately the organizers were gracious enough to allow me to record this presentation for you instead. So I apologize for one more video presentation, one more Zoom session that reflects one more part of the very great deal that this pandemic has taken from us. My topic today is Judge Williams and Constitutional Law. My paper, whose title is Law Within Limits, looks at constitutional theory from, unsurprisingly, the perspective of a judge on an intermediate appellate court, one who is regularly constrained to follow precedent, whether from the Supreme Court, the en banc court, or a prior panel, but who nonetheless maintains independent views on what the right answers really are. Judge Williams did not specialize in constitutional theory, his main work lay elsewhere, but he did think deeply about the Constitution. Uh, his views, if I were to summarize them, represented something like a policy-inflected originalism, where the rules laid down by the founders were clear, in his view, we were obliged to follow them. And when their commands are unclear, when they require interpretation to discover what rules they imposed, we should interpret those commands in line with the reasons the founders had for including them in the first place. Or to put it another way, in Judge Williams' view, I would say, our constitutional law is based on the founder's rules and reasons. So in his early work on the due process clause, he concluded that the rule in fact was somewhat clear, that the reference to liberty protected a physical freedom from incarceration and not the fundamental rights that were addressed, if at all, by the 14th Amendment's privileges or immunities clause. And he criticized the effort to stuff liberty full of every good thing, like a Christmas stocking, as little more than a counsel of, to the courts to assume the role of a council of revision. At the same time, Judge Williams thought it entirely legitimate when interpreting a genuine ambiguity to consider the kinds of policy interests that justified the rules adoption in the first place. Judges might engage in half-baked policy analysis, he wrote, but that was better than doing the same kind of analysis in a quarter-baked way. This kind of explicit consideration of policy may sound outré in some quarters, but has a re reasonably long pedigree. Um, Madison, in debating the bank bill, said that where the meaning is clear, the consequences, whatever they may be, are to be admitted. Where doubtful, it is fairly triable by its consequences. And Judges, Judge Williams' consideration of the consequences was miles away from the pragmatism, perhaps, of a Judge Posner, who would first look for a sensible solution and only then ask whether that solution is blocked by some authoritative precedent. Instead, what made the solution sensible for Judge Williams was in part the fact that it was the framers' solution. So, for example, in Nixon versus United States, the Senate had had certain impeachment testimony against Judge Nixon heard by committee rather than by the full body. And the panel of the D.C. Circuit had to answer whether Nixon's challenge to his impeachment was justiciable. The Constitution didn't speak to the question explicitly, neither did any statute, and no binding precedent seemed to control it either. So Judge Williams looked to the founders' reasons for committing impeachment trials to the Senate and for keeping them away from the courts. Those reasons, as far as we can tell, focused on checks and balances and on avoiding giving unreviewable power to any one branch. If the president can appoint the judges, those judges might not be fully independent when trying him, which is why in Philadelphia they gave the job to the Senate instead. Likewise, Hamilton and the Federalists saw impeachment as, as Judge Williams put it, the basis for constraining usurpation by judges, which made it unlikely that the same judges could then declare reinstated a person that the Senate had declared removed. 
Now, it's always possible to create a parade of horribles in which the Senate engages in ever stranger procedures free of judicial review. But Judge Williams said, if the Senate should ever be ready to abdicate its responsibilities to school children, or moved by Caligula's appointment of his horse as senator to an elephant from the National Zoo, then the Republic will have sunk to depths from which no court could rescue it. By contrast, if the impeachment claims of a fellow judge were justiciable, the circle would be closed. The judiciary would have final, unreviewable power over the one procedure established to restrain excesses and all its other final and unreviewable powers. Checkmate. Now, this attention to text, history, and structure, expressed as ever in the judge's inimitable style, might work well when you as a judge have the freedom to decide. But most of the time, a judge on an intermediate appellate court won't be facing a question of first impression. There's going to be precedent on the ground already, often precedent that seems incorrect as a matter of founding rules and reasons. So what would you do? Rather than say, as some judges may have, they can't reverse everything, Judge Williams faithfully applied the precedents that applied to him. He never lost sight, though, of the law for which they stood. He would often write concurring opinions, pointing out the defects in circuit or Supreme Court precedent and urging its reconsideration. Occasionally, he wrote concurrences to his own majority opinions, first applying the doctrines and then roundly criticizing them. Or in some cases, he might work to rule, as it were, applying the precedent he was given so exactly that the wrongness of it just leaps off the page. Um, I'm thinking here in particular of his opinion on remand and Turner Broadcasting System, in which he was instructed by the Supreme Court to apply intermediate scrutiny and to conduct more fact-finding regarding the relations between broadcasters and cable systems. He conducted so much more fact-finding, um, indeed more than twice the length of the majority opinion uh, was his dissent, to the point where the Supreme Court's conclusion that this was merely a content-neutral regulation and surely not a content-based attempt at rent-seeking by certain participants in the market just becomes utterly risible. Now, of course, showing that the Supreme Court is wrong, even badly wrong, doesn't mean that their decisions get overruled. And there are plenty of cynics who will claim that the law is just whatever the Supreme Court says it is. And indeed, for many judges on the unfortunately named inferior courts, and for many of the lawyers who practice in front of them, they experience something like this in their daily lives. Uh, most judges are lower court judges, most litigators appear mostly before lower courts, and most legal education is aimed one way or another at lower court practice. Um, we might have our students in class debate the correctness of high court opinions, but then we train them to repeat back the holdings of those same opinions as gospel on the black letter part of the exam. So this focus makes it easy for students, for professors, for lawyers, even for judges to confuse the law with what the paper calls lower court law, a blend of the actual legal rules and the intervening precedent that temporarily displaces them. In our legal system, the Constitution is not just whatever the Supreme Court says it is. Even the highest court of the land can get things wrong. And mistaking one sort of law for the other is fatal to a proper understanding. Judge Williams did not make that mistake. Over the decades of his distinguished service, he was hardly averse to high quality doctrinal analysis, to reading a mass of cases and pulling them together into a coherent whole. He praised that kind of analysis, he criticized those who scorned it, and he was remarkably adept at carrying it out. But he never took it as the sum and substance of constitutional law. Instead, as a judge, he articulated and acted on his constitutional views in cases of first impression, in filling the gaps between precedents, and in criticizing some of the Supreme Court decisions that he faithfully obeyed. He did so through a careful consideration of text and history, with an eye to the economic causes and consequences of legal doctrine, and with a fierce independence of mind. And where he followed the reasoning of dubious precedent, he did so with the kind of intellectual precision and attention to the record familiar to anyone who knew him. As to that familiarity, I would like to conclude with a few potentially off-topic personal reflections about Judge Williams. None of you need me to tell you, although I will, what an extraordinary person he was as a boss, as a mentor, as a thinker, and as a judge. Behind the formality of his speech and the rigor of his reasoning, there is an incredible informality of manner, as well as a very great kindness and sympathy. 
Um, I distinctly remember walking into his office for the first time, the office of the senior United States Circuit Judge, and seeing on the wall a large poster of a baby seal of the kind that my six-year-old daughter might ask me to put up in her room. I also remember how quick he could be to identify the one point in an attorney's argument that had gone wrong, or how sudden the knock could be that announced that he was standing at the office door, ready to sit down in an armchair and discuss the next case. Uh, you know not the day nor the hour. In the last few years, we would see each other regularly twice a year at meetings for the ALI advisory group for the third restatement of conflicts. That group has not had any in-person meetings since the pandemic began. And when they return, I'm not entirely sure how it will feel to go back and not see him there. I will miss him terribly. I will miss his intellect and rigor, his incisive style, his keen sense of fairness and unfairness, his devotion to law and to liberty, and his fundamental kindness toward others. Those of us who in various ways follow in his footsteps could do far worse than seeking to imitate him, and we probably will. May his memory be for a blessing, for his family, for those of us who knew him, for those who have benefited from his work and good counsel, and for the country that he served. Thank you very much. Again, Professor Sachs uh, wrote a paper for the symposium. You can find it on our website along with all the other papers we've discussed. Uh, his is titled, Law Within Limits, Judge Williams and the Constitution. Next, we'll hear from Professor Michael Grieva. Michael is a professor of law at the Antonin Scalia Law School. Of course, he's written no shortage of books and articles on the Constitution, in particular federalism, including his book, The Upside Down Constitution. And his paper is titled, So Close and Yet So Far Away, Judge Stephen F. Williams on Federalism. Michael? Thank you, Adam. And I promise I won't need another 10 minutes today. Um, I'll <laughs> do this. Uh, I, I'm supposed to talk about federalism, but I want to key off some uh, observation in Steve's, uh, Steve Sachs's paper uh, that are in the paper. He didn't mention those phrases just now, but trust me, they're in the paper and they struck me as exactly right. So uh, one of the things uh, that Steve emphasizes is Steve Williams's quote, fiercely independent mind. Um, and I want to emphasize how unlikely that actually was for a man of his generation to have that. So he graduated from Harvard Law School in 1961. That was the zenith of legal process theory and therefore the absolute nadir uh, of American jurisprudence. Um, if you have the misfortune of having to teach stuff like, you know, statutory interpretation, federal courts, uh, you know, that stuff is bad enough to drain your brain any day of the week. None of that left any trace on Steve Williams at all. He joined the federal bench in 1986. That was the heyday of originalism slash textualism in a very aggressively dogmatic form. That was not a form of independent thought of all. That was just legal process with a minus sign. So when they say um, legislative history, we say no. When they say legislative intent, we say meaning. And then we have uh, three decades worth of discussion about what the original meaning of meaning of meaning was, because that is how we get tenure. That didn't leave a trace on Steve Williams either. As Steve emphasizes, Steve Sachs emphasizes in his paper, he never joined this theory wars, uh, as Steve calls it. And that is actually amazing. I mean, for all those of us who knew Steve Williams, he was interested in absolutely everything, just not that. Um, I've never had a conversation about uh, that stuff with him. So how did he think? And I think Tom Merrill had him right. <clears throat> like a political economist, but in a very sort of anti posnerian spirit. So it wasn't like, hey, I'm an economist. I can do pyrotechnics. And because I'm a judge and you are not, we will now do what I say and what seems reasonable to me. That wasn't Steve. Um, the way he thought, I think, was 
What's the real world problem to which this legal instrument, crafted by others with authority, is supposed to be the solution? And you can ask that of the Constitution and of statutes and of administrative regulations. If you apply that to federalism, you end up with an approach that is orthogonal to both forms uh, of uh, conservative federalism, I think. <clears throat> One of the forms I have in mind is balanced federalism, right? So we have to protect federalism's numerous advantages, and we have to protect vertical federalism's balance between the states and the federal government, and then we have to protect the state's dignity because states are people too. And if you don't believe that that is uh, the way the court used to go about it, go reread cases like Gregory. And the other form is clause-bound originalism, which says that, um, oh, by the way, there's no dormant commerce clause, and everything we thought about from Gibbons on is wrong. Uh, Steve did not care about either one of these forms. He wrote straight out, I don't care about any federalism balance. That's all totally made up. So instead, you ask yourself at the front end, what is federalism good for? And that prompts several insights. So first, it prompts the insight that federalism is a they and not an it. Um, in its good forms, it will serve local preference satisfaction and create a tolerably efficient market for legal rules. And in it bad forms, it will allow to st states to tax and regulate outsiders, because that's always easier than to tax and regulate your own citizens. And whether you have one federalism or the other depends on fairly complex sets of rules and institutions, and you had better pay attention and think about them. <clears throat> the second thing is you can't stick build your own federalism, obviously. So what is the Constitution? tell us about it, and you look at it and you discover three things. One is it conspicuously omits any balancing rule. There's a balancing rule in every feder other federal constitution I've seen, not that one. Two, it provides the federal government with plenty of authority to do stuff that states cannot provide on their own, to solve collective action problems, as Steve would have said and did say. And three, it teams with horizontal federalism rules that protect uh, states from one another and organize state-to-state -state relations on principles of equality, non-aggression, and comedy. Neither balanced federalists nor originalists, I mean, clause-bound originalists, care one whit about any of that. Steve cared deeply about it. Uh, he repeatedly lamented uh, the court's wholesale indifference to sort of the textual federalism norms uh, and the bad stuff that states can do to one another. <clears throat> and instead of going to town on Gibbons versus Ogden or McCulloch or anything and the Dormant Commerce Clause, he worked through the doctrine. And what he came up with is a non-discrimination rule uh, backed by a rule against circumvention. Um, and at the same time, he cautioned courts to be careful not to go to town uh, with these rules beyond reason because states might react very badly and because the risk of error, judicial error is very, very high when you start uh, analyzing tax incidents and the like. And he approached federal preemption in the same frame of mind. So before you start microanalyzing statutes or operate with some global presumption against preemption, um, ask, what is the collective action problem that Congress was actually trying to solve here? The answer may be none at all. Congress may just be reshuffling rents. Uh, but at least it's worth asking at the front end. <clears throat> and so long as states are regulating their own affairs and their own citizens uh, on top of a federal standard, uh, yeah, by all means have a presumption against preemption because there's no federalism risk at all, no collective action problem at all. Once they start regulating citizens in other states or fragment and exploit network industries, operate with the opposite presumption, read the federal statute as a floor and a ceiling. Obviously, you cannot mobilize these presumptions against the text of the statute, but at least, but you need some set of presumptions to make sense of the world at all. And these are as good as any other read the statutes in that light. If you want an example, uh, one of uh, Steve's 
uh, final opinions, published opinions on the DC Circuit was Mozilla versus FCC. Um, so the majority holds that uh, when the FCC brings the net neutrality hammer down on ISPs, the reg has preemptive force. And when the agency reverts to a light touch regulation, that's not arbitrary and capricious, but all of a sudden the regs lose their preemptive force. So then each state is now free to do what the agency under the statute just says it doesn't want to do. Steve wrote a terrific dissent in that case. It starts with a great, great Shakespeare quote. It then says, excuse me, the internet is actually a network industry. Uh, and then it proceeds, there is no reason why you would read that statute in that way or presume that that is what any sentient Congress might have had in mind. <clears throat> Steve Sachs, and this is my final remark, um, acknowledges there are reasons um, to be a little bit suspicious of this mode of thinking. I mean, it's out of fashion now, right? It's too loose for many minds, not easily captured in a formula or sort of meta-linguistic post-Wittgensteinian hermeneutics or whatever the hell it is they do at Georgetown and Harvard now. Um, but if you think that way, you end up with a federalism that not only makes more sense, that is much closer to the original constitution than what many modern day originalists are capable of producing. And you, believe it or not, may even be able to make uh, some sense of the stuff that Congress and the agencies produce. At least that's what happened when Steve Williams did it. Uh, that's hard to replicate, but we should all at least try. Thanks, Mike. Uh, before, today's, um, before today's proceedings, I was chatting with a friend and, and describing the papers that would be discussed today and the authors, and I was sort of clicking through in alphabetical order, and he cut me off and he said, but will nobody talk about the Russia books? And I said, well, you haven't let me get to Z yet. Uh, and so now I'll introduce our panel's third speaker, Nathaniel Zielinski. Uh, Nathaniel's an associate at Hogan and Lovells and a member of the firm's Supreme Court and appellate practice. He was a clerk for Judge Williams from 2019 until the judge's passing in 2020. And shortly after his passing, he wrote a, a beautiful blog post on the Yale Journal of Regulation blog titled Personal Reflections by a Last Clerk. And I'd encourage you to read it. I'm so glad that Nathaniel is able to join us today to write and speak on the subject of some of Judge Williams' uh, most interesting writings, his writings on liberal reform uh, in Russia. And so uh, Nathaniel's paper is titled, Stephen F. Williams on Liberalism, the need to see a share of truth on the opposite side and a share of error on one's own. Nathaniel? Thank you, Adam, uh, Michael. Uh, thank you for allowing me to join this panel. I'm, I'm conscious of the fact that I'm outclassed by not just my fellow panelists, but those who came before. Um, and I confess a certain amount of trepidation to touching the judge's books on Russia. I am not the clerk he would hire uh, to help him on those books. I don't speak a word of Russian. He used to hire a Russian-speaking clerk. Uh, I also know that liberalism is a pretty elusive topic. Uh, so uh, I don't think I can capture the judge's breadth and depth of thinking. Um, so what I instead want to do is engage in a little bit of a conceit and ask what I might have told Judge Williams were he here. Um, one of the best parts of the job for clerking for Judge Williams was you would send the judge articles, um, snippets, op-eds, whatever it was throughout the day that would interest him, often horrify him, um, and then you would discuss them over lunch. Um, so what would I have said to Judge Williams uh, if you were here and we were to have lunch. Um, well, in order to tell you what I would have said, I want to first lay out uh, a little bit of a summary of the books because I'm going to suspect that folks are a little less familiar, even if they're familiar with his case law, uh, with what he wrote uh, about pre-revolutionary Russia. So the judge had two books. The first was a liberal reform in an illiberal regime. And that focuses on the effort to reform peasant property rights in pre-revolutionary czarist Russia. And it's, above all, a richly detailed economic history. Um, it is situated in a time and a place uh, 
But Judge William asks uh, a broader meta question, which is can authoritarian countries uh, or countries generally inculcate liberal values from the top down through broad scale legal, in this case legal reform, uh, or must those liberal values gradually accrete from the bottom up? So to understand why the judge asked that question requires understanding a little bit about pre-revolutionary Russian property. And I promise this will be brief. Um, at a general level, right, pre-revolutionary Russia uh, is- I'll give you two minutes. <laughs> uh, herein I insert a semicolon into my one sentence explanation. Um, it was an outgrowth, right? Pre-revolutionary Russia is seeing um, uh, 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 unrest and it's an outgrowth of Russian poverty. Uh, peasant poverty in particular. But at a technical level, there are three features that Judge Williams identifies that define Russian agricultural laws. And he's really working off of, and he himself acknowledges this, um, the insights of Ronald Coase. Uh, but the three inefficiencies are, right, the Russians uh, are using an open field system still, so they have scattered plots. So the peasant plots are scattered all around the commune. Um, an individual peasant uh, would also see their plots go under a uh, repartition process. So every couple of years, the commune would cycle which peasants had uh, which particular scattered plots. Um, and even if a, a plot didn't go through the repartition process, uh, peasants still held their property uh, in a family unit. So it's pretty easy to see where the inefficiencies are here. If your plots are scattered, it's really hard to get economies of scale. If you're constantly reshuffling your plots, you're not going to invest. Um, and if you're holding your plots in a family peasant unit, um, you're going to have really difficult problems of entry and exit and, and decision making. Um, Judge Williams focused on the efforts of Russian Prime Minister uh, Pierre Stolypin, and I apologize because I'm a Russian expert if I'm butchering any of these names. Um, and Stolypin's reforms um, sought to address each of these specific problems. But what Stolypin was really trying to do was to use the reforms of private property to inculcate what the judge refers to as the liberal habits of mind. And here I'm just going to quote from uh, Judge Williams' writing on what those liberal habits are, because uh, he does a far better job of uh, identifying them than I could. And this is Judge Williams. He says, individuals, not all of them, uh, but at least enough to set a tone, must think of themselves as responsible, right-bearing citizens, be realistic, not fatalistic or utopian, be bold and outspoken, capable of compromise, ready to organize the sorts of groups that make up civil society, and be tolerant of groups with differing ideas and interests. So at the end of the day, Judge Williams actually offers a rather mixed, if negative, impression about the efforts of reform in pre-revolutionary Russia. Um, he ultimately concludes that the reform that had emerged was gradual and slow. Um, and to the extent that authoritarians permit reform, um, they tend to do so when they can't see the reform coming around the corner. He in particular identifies a number of flaws in the reforms that were the result of the czarist regime not wanting to, in fact, empower the peasantry too much. Um, I think this is an honest assessment um, in many ways from someone who probably wanted to be more hopeful uh, about the ability to inculcate liberal values uh, through legal reform. And then the second book uh, is The Reformer, uh, How One Liberal Fought to Preempt the Russian Revolution. And it traces the life of Vasily uh, Maklikov. Uh, Maklikov was a lawyer. He's a left-leaning politician. He's something of a Renaissance man. Um, he was a celebrated courtroom advocate. Uh, he's a member of the Russian Duma, which is a sort of nascent Russian legislature. He's friends with Tolstoy. He plays a part in the plot to kill Rasputin. Read the judge's book. That's uh, <laughs> the message I'm trying to give. But just to focus on what I want to talk about today, um, Maklikov was not a utopian, and that's the judge's own uh, analysis. Maklikov recognized the political necessity of compromise uh, in a constitutional system, uh, the need for the state to be able to govern, um, and the value of real-world results over ideological purity. Um, this pragmatism was reflected and furthered by Maklikov's willingness to befriend and embrace those uh, to both his right and to his left. I think it's difficult to read The Reformer, especially as a lawyer, and not fall in love with Maklikov. Uh, it's also very difficult, especially as someone who admired Judge Williams, not to see something of Judge Williams echoed back in his portrait of Maklikov. Um, the judge tells us that Maklikov had a charm and capacity for friendship uh, with those with radically different views, as well as, and this is actually a quote from Kerensky, um, deriding Maklikov, quote, the lawyer's professional habit of seeing the share of truth in the opposite side and the share of error in one's own. 
I think we could all say something very similar about Judge Williams. Um, I will, because I imagine I'm running over time, just give you two very brief anecdotes about Maklakov um, that I think capture this. The first is Maklakov actually meets with Stolypin, the person doing the economic reforms that the judge um, had wrote his first book about in liberal form. And um, when Maklakov does this, he's actually sort of breaking the party ranks. He does so secretly, um, and there is a tremendous fur. And the judge writes um, that he finds this fur of Maklakov's willingness to meet with Stolypin and breach, uh, uh, sorry, broach a compromise as deeply concerning. Um, he says the dominant opinion on both sides at the time in Russia regarded even talking with their political opponents as a workless activity or worse. Um, there then is another moment where Maklakov is engaged in a debate with Kerensky. Um, and Kerensky is uh, the person who ends up becoming the leader of the provisional government that ultimately falls to the Bolsheviks. Um, and I want to read in particular Maklakov's rejoinder to Kerensky when Kerensky refuses to support Maklakov's efforts um, to constitutionalize um, the reforms that Stolypin, or pass through legislative means, the reforms that Stolypin had ultimately passed um, in 1906 for uh, reforming peasant property rights. And uh, Maklakov says this, while we live in a constitutional order, we must know that constitutional life requires compromise. Kerensky has a different position. He'd be glad if the Duma rejected the law and threw off the mask, as they say, this would expose the illusion and show that it's impossible to hope for peaceful legislation. Of course, in truth, the, pe the peasants would gain nothing, but they could read his attractive, beautiful speech. So that brings me to the point of my talk that has less to do with Judge Williams. Um, and it's the point of what would I have said to Judge Williams if he were here today? Um, I won't belabor it because I know I'm running out of time. Um, but I think we're all losing, of all political persuasions, um, the liberal habits of mind that Judge Williams wrote about but also that he himself embodied. Um, the parallels, I think, in America today to pre-revolutionary Russia are real. Um, not perfect, but disturbing. Um, and I think what Judge Williams wrote about the response to Maklakov's meeting with Stolypin rings true. Both sides regard, and this is the judge's words, even talking with their political opponents as a worthless activity or worse. Um, I couldn't go on, and I have uh, in the paper that I've written, but I think I will um, highlight just two things. The first is that I don't think that Stephen Williams could be nominated by a Republican president and confirmed by a Republican Senate uh, today. One can fairly accuse both sides of vetting judicial nominees for ideological fitness, but I think something that we heard both in Stephen's paper, and particularly from Michael, um, is that Judge Williams had too many idiosyncratic views, I suspect, to pass through the gauntlet unscathed today. And I think it's true that the conservative legal movement views an increasingly narrow set of values, in particular a hyper-strict originalism and a hyper-strict textualism, neither of which I think Judge Williams embodied, as the sole and legitimate views of the craft. This isn't to dismiss that original meaning might be a useful tool or that text might be a useful tool and to suggest that they're never controlling considerations. They are. Um, but taken to the extreme, I think that originalism and textualism represent the kind of utopianism that the judge was arguing against. I also think, and this is, I think, the last thing I will leave you with, that there is an echo chamber effect. Part of this um, is, occurs, for instance, to give you an example, uh, when certain judges only hire clerks who bear particular ideological litmus markers. Um, and among, I think, younger conservative lawyers, one sometimes finds in uncritical acceptance of the views of a very particular small set of scholars um, and a narrow set of Supreme Court justices. I think that up and down the food chain, elite lawyers of all political stripes are potentially losing the ability to see the measure of fault in one's own side and the value in the other. This was all truly anathema to Stephen Williams. Peter Conti Brown, who's another Williams clerk, recently wrote that the judge hired people, and I think this is entirely correct, solely for capabilities. In Peter's words, the judges did not give two wits about a clerk's politics. Uh, in public remarks, the judge referred to Vasily Maklakov as someone who sought out fellowship of people who are not so much like-minded as like-hearted. I think that was Stephen Williams. Um, the judge's moderation in many ways ran deeper. Um, no one today has talked about the judge's work on criminal law and the ways in which he ruled in criminal cases. Um, but Without a doubt, Judge Williams favored criminal defendants, and he sought to protect ordinary individuals from the arbitrary excesses of the American criminal justice system. 
over and over again, Judge Williams bucked the stereotypically conservative approach and made common cause with more than one left-leaning left judge um, without a second's he hesitation. So I will end by saying it's unclear to me how American society reclaims moderation. That's the word the judge used in his talk about Maklakov uh, at Yale in 2017. Um, I don't know how we do it in the law. I don't know how we do it in politics more generally. Um, but I think it wouldn't be too hard to start by looking at the life that Vasily Maklakov led and the life that Stephen Williams led. And I think we have a charge. It's to evaluate ideas and their own merits, to extend an open hand to all, regardless of their ideological underpinnings, and to strive for compromise. And if compromise is not possible, to disagree as intellectually as possible without snark or animus. Thanks, Nathaniel. Um, I'll give both of our speakers a chance to reflect on what's been said so far, and I have some questions. But since Steve Sachs isn't here, I just want to highlight two points in his paper that I found particularly interesting. Uh, one is his discussion of Judge Williams' opinion in the D.C. Circuit's version of the Shelby County case. Uh, obviously, by the time that case reached the Supreme Court and was decided by the Supreme Court, it was uh, controversial to say the least. I think one of the points that comes across well, both in Steve's paper and also Nathaniel touches on the case as well, I think I get a little bit of feedback, I'm sorry. Um, but something that com comes across in both papers is the extent to which Judge Williams handled the issue so well, um, in part because he handled it so thoroughly. Uh, his opinion in the case really walks through the facts of the statute, the, uh, the, the controversy in general, and reading that, I wondered if maybe he was aided in that tax task by the fact that he was an inferior court judge. Um, a Supreme Court justice might be able to handle the issue more swiftly, more confidently, and with less restraints on the mode of their argument. Um, of course, a lower court judge doesn't enjoy those luxuries. And judge Williams' colleague on the DC Circuit, Judge Silberman, has often pointed out the ways in which the lower courts are forced to act more like courts than the Supreme Court is. And that's not a criticism of the merits of the case. Uh, it's just a, an observation that Judge Williams' opinion was certainly thorough in a way that I think helped lend credibility to his argument. And maybe we'll circle back later, but I guess my thought I'm left with is maybe how lucky we were that Judge Williams was on the DC Circuit. Um, it would have been nice to have him on the Supreme Court too. But having him on the DC Circuit allowed him to be a, a judge in the fullest and best sense and uh, an inspiration to justices and other judges. My second observation on Sachs's piece, uh, he alludes to a piece that Judge Williams himself wrote. Um, it was a speech he gave in 1999, and it was published later in the Green Bag, and it's titled, The More Law, The Less Rule of Law. And I've lost the page now, but, um, oh, here it is. But Steve's, Steve's article, he points out that that Williams had reflected on the complexity of law today and the sort of constant blizzard of rules and laws. And Steve says, this complexity brings many benefits, providing for uniform decisions within and across different court systems. I guess here he's talking about the, the different precedents from circuit to circuit. He says, but it also carries a cost. Judge Williams once wrote that at some point, the growth of law has a tendency to shrink the rule of law. I'd really encourage you to go back and read Williams' own writing, again, it's called The More Law, The Less Rule of Law, because it reminded me of, of, of James Madison's own observations in his original memo on the, the vices of our pre-constitutional government, and then in, in Federalist 62, where Madison reflected on the multiplicity of laws and how having too much law undermines the rule of law itself. I don't think Williams actually directly invoked Madison's writings, which is nice. It just shows that Judge Williams had such a sort of implicitly Madisonian uh, temperament of his own. So those are just my reflections on Steve's paper. Mike, Nathaniel, do you have any, anything you'd like to add based on what's been said so far, or can I just launch in with the questions? You can launch. I just have sort of one. Uh, I, I don't know whether Nathaniel agrees with it, but uh, it's sort of halfway anecdotal. Um, but it struck me when, when I, I read his paper, and it's this. So when the judge uh, presented his book, the Maklakov book, <clears throat> at, at the Cato Institute, you know, was, I mean, 
it was not a big audience. It's like 15 people around the table and sort of what do we think about this and what do we think about that? Uh, what struck me was, um, so, I mean, I'd read the book uh, and Steve gave a very confident presentation of it uh, and uh, partly because it stru really struck me, but partly to be just contrarian, which is my habit, I reminded him of this passage in Karl Marx, where Marx says, look, it may be the case that some people are just born for slavery, and the Russians are like that. Um, does that ring a bell? And Steve, I mean, reacted, you know, not well, shall we say. I mean, he rarely lost his cool. He never lost his cool, right? But he got a little irritated about, you know, why would anybody say that, and I want to resist that. Um, it is true, however, that I think um, it shows something about the way his mind worked that he looked for liberalism in very unlikely places, the least likely places, and that shows a great I mean that that illustrates just the way he thought and and you know his his mindset and and I'll add one other thing. Um, uh, people tend to say, "Whoa, economic analysis!" And now if there's somebody who brings that to bear on the law, and that has to be a narrow-minded person. And I think what you remarked about, or what you elaborated on, um, his emphasis on liberal habits of mind is very, very important. So just by way of anecdote, I mean, um, my wife uh, works on China issues, and uh, we had lots of discussions about that, and um, uh, there were, over the years, there was this very optimistic view of the World Trade Organization and what we can do about China and turning that into a liberal democracy. And there's certain naive assumptions about um, what the political scientists call modernization. Once you make them rich, all of these people will demand liberal democracy, right? And I mean, if you're an economic determinist, you're kind of likely to believe that. If you're a political scientist and a model builder, um, like the people who hopped around at Cornell when, when I was there, <clears throat> you're likely to believe that Steve never believe that, and so the questions that he asked, I, to my mind, they're much more cultural, much more difficult to squeeze into some, some preconceived model, but they're really essential to my mind, and that always impressed me. I mean, I think I agree. I, I will say, as to your initial story about the judge and the Maklakov book, I mean, I, I will say two things. One is, I had read the Maklakov book before. Um, I had not read Liberal Reform, his book on the Stolypian reforms. And it, when I read both of the books together, one of the things I was struck by was how depressing they are. If you're coming in, no, no I mean this seriously, they're yeah, you know, yeah. wonderful books. Maklakov is a wonderful book in particular. But if you're coming in from the preconception of, I support liberalism, I love liberal values, they're very depressing books. Uh, because Maklakov is an oddity. He is this constitutional figure in an uh, authoritarian state. Um, and there's no good explanation of how he materializes. Um, and the same is true in the Stolypian reform book. Um, you uh, ultimately get the sense from Judge Williams that you know, this is a man who loved liberalism, um, that it's ultimately a project that is um, slowly accreting um, and faces a lot of challenges. So um, I, I think. I'm, I'm surprised you reacted as negatively, given that I think maybe that's a message I take away from the books as well a little bit. Um, not the same among the Russians, but, but how difficult it ultimately is to cultivate those values and habits of mind. Um, and I think the reverse is true. It's very easy, as you write in your paper, to stick to a certain set of dogmatic views on, in your case, uh, preemption. Um, and to view sort of a narrow, to view these doctrines um, in, a, in a very unworkable light. Um, and I think that Judge Williams approached statutes, just pick one example, to make them work. Um, and I don't think right. he did it in a way that sought to add text that wasn't there or to, you know, to, to venture outside, but he ultimately recognized that there was an administrative state that needed to function. 
Um, and I think that, to come back to my critique, I think a lot of <coughs> current critiques of the administrative state want to burn it all down. And I don't think Steve Williams was looking to burn it all down. I think he was looking to make it work. Um, he had an angle that he was coming at from it. Um, but at the end of the day, he wanted certain key agencies to function. So I have a question about his federalism. Uh, like one thing your paper touches on and other papers as well, Judge Williams wasn't sort of doctrinaire in terms of having a small set of rules that he'd apply across all statutes simply. He took a much more nuanced approach or a, con a contextual approach. And in judges, Judge Williams' hands, that strikes me as terrific. Um, but they're not all Judge Williams. And I'm wondering whether Judge Williams' approach on federalism and preemption, as great as it was in his hands, might be ill-suited for a judiciary as a whole. Um, Justice Scalia, of course, recognized that it's good to have simple, straightforward, broad rules that everybody, not just government and judges, but the public at large, sort of knows in advance how they ought to operate. Um, and that's a basis for a rule of law. And I'm wondering, do you see Judge Williams' own approach as in tension with that, or am I overstating it? And if we're not going to have a federal judiciary full of Stephen Williams's, uh, do we need to sort of thank him for his approach in his hands, but urge other judges to take a different approach? <clears throat> That's a long question, um, or, or a complicated question. Uh, and of course, if you're nervous about this approach, that's where that goes, right? What would this look like in somebody else's hands? Oh my goodness, uh, let's stick to the test uh, text. So um, uh, let me ask, I mean, let me give you sort of one concrete example. And the paper walks through some of this, right? I just did not want to talk about severance taxes and FERC regulation in front of this audience. I'd be happy to if you want to know. But, um, <laughs> right? So let me give you one example. Um, preemption doctrine, that's a wonderful example um, to my mind. Uh, I cannot begin to tell you how many panels on preemption cases I've, I organized in a prior life at American Enterprise Institute and then at the LEC. And so you invite some trial lawyers and then you invite some industry guys, right, and or gals. Um, and no matter what the subject is, whether it's, you know, drugs or FERC or the, C the SEC, they all agree across the board on three things. One, whatever you do, do not give this back to Congress, ever. Because anything can happen in Congress, and so long as we're with the agency, at least we know who we're talking about, and we have some accountability. That's one. Second. The presumption against preemption across the board, everybody agrees that that comes and goes without explanation from case to case. Nobody knows where it came from. It makes no sense whatsoever, at least not in a sort of highly generalist way. And then you migrate to the other end and say, well, why don't we just read the text of these statutes? And then they microanalyze the um, these statutes, and the trial lawyers and the industry people say at the same time, that makes no sense either. I mean, I'll tell you one anecdote. Um, it's a little preemption case. It's called Spritzma versus Mercury Marine. And it's all about Geyer preemption. I won't bore you with the details. But in one case, the statute in Geyer says state law. And in the next case, it says in Geyer, the statute is the Boat Act says a state law, okay? And they have sort of a big um, sort of uh, moot court argument at Mayor Brown uh, and Ken Starr starts leaning on them and say, um, guys, you have a problem with the indefinite article A because in one case, when it says state law, that preempts state common law, and when it says a state law, that has to mean a state statute or regulation, but not the common law. And Steve Shapiro 
screams at cancers, I'm not going to lose a preemption case over the indefinite Article A. <laughs> oh, yes, did he ever lose it over the indefinite article. You microanalyze statutes without any kind of attention to what Congress tried to do there, without any kind of presumption as to what these statutes might mean and what they're supposed to be doing. That's what you end up with, right? So my sense of this is, look, on the one hand, <clears throat> you have to learn you cannot read these statutes without some set of presumptions. And then the only reasonable debate is, what exactly are these presumptions going to look like? And how aggressively are you going to deploy them? And that's the statutory interpretation debate that's worth having. Yeah. Neither brain dead clause boundness, nor let's make it up, are reasonable answers to that set of questions. You just cannot get away from it. And if that means that Steve Williams has to have a debate with David Tatel, fine, let him have that debate. I'm listening all day long. Yeah, years ago, another one of the judges on the DC circuit was talking to me and reflecting on Judge Williams' uh, liberalism, his libertarianism. And, and this judge, who's a conservative but not a libertarian, said, you know, Steve's a libertarian. And he's a really great libertarian. And if all libertarians were Steve, then we should all be libertarians. Uh, but they're not. Uh, and so some of us need to go another way. And, and hearing you there and, and, remind, and reading that part of your paper reminded me of that as well. We touched a little bit on, on Nathaniel's uh, remark about the liberal habits of mind. And Mike, I saw a, a moment in your paper that touches on that too, just not by name. In, um, what was the case? You were talking about the Mozilla case. Um, and I, we won't get into the details. We say that a lot in any panel that, that touches on administrative law. Um, but Mike, you sort of parse the issues and, and the way that Judge Williams eventually goes. But you, you point out that, that Judge Williams probably could have gone further if he had wanted to, made a much more sort of a much broader, more categorical ruling. But you say at the end of that part of the discussion, you say, in his written opinion, Steve did not go there. He did not need to, and you add quite plainly, however, that's what he thought. And that brings us back to the sort of the distinction between Judge Williams' role as a judge and Judge Williams' role as a scholar, and just as a interested and interesting person. You were his friend for, for many, many years. Nathaniel, you were one of his last law clerks and saw him work up close. And I'm wondering if we could touch on that a little bit, the, the distinction between Judge Williams' approach as a judge versus his approach as a scholar and how these two parts of him sort of fit together in, in, in one person. Michael, since I'm drawn from your paper in particular, maybe we'll start with you. How, do you. how did you see the difference between Williams as a scholar and a judge and how it played out in his work? You have two minutes. I have two minutes. Um, I mean, obviously, I mean, this is now sort of as a scholar, as in his, his written articles, right? And I have to uh, confess, I, I'm now focusing on the sort of pieces mm -hmm. uh, that he wrote. Um, there, obviously, as a scholar, you know, you are at liberty to sort of speculate, well, how about this, how about that, how about the other thing, right? And I'm contemplating all kinds of things. So that they're, they're written in a very d different style. Um, and some of them um, are sort of a little more doctrinal uh, and speculative in a good sense. And I'm thinking in particular of a piece that it's noteworthy. And Steve Sachs's paper, I mean, Steve hit upon the same article, right? It's here's a general framework for sort of preemption. Right? But he emphasized that, look, this is a useful conceptual framework, useful way to think about this. How about it? This was a talk given at Northwestern. Um, he emphasized at that same time that, look, what I do as a judge with that stuff and how any given case shakes out, this is not determinative. This is just a general framework. What happens in any given case will depend on the statute and careful attention to the details. And that's what I do as a judge. So these are, you know, really two different things. I do not think, 
that that's in principle any different from other celebrated judges who also write a ton of stuff. Yeah. Nathaniel, you didn't know Judge Williams as long as Mike did, but you got obviously to work with him up close um, in his, his, his final months. And so maybe the easier way to frame the question for you is, how did these sorts of things play out in discussions with him as he was grappling with concrete cases? I'm sure there were a lot of cases where he could have framed the arguments better than the litigants themselves, um, better than the agencies themselves. But of course, as a judge, he's bound by the materials he's given. So how did you see you know, firsthand this play out in his, his work and trying to translate the briefs and the law into judicial opinions? Sure. Um, so I'll be careful in what I say, because I very carefully want to preserve the judge's confidences. Um, and I, I feel very strongly about that. Um, I will say two things about Judge Williams. The first is, um, I don't think anyone in that room knew the record as well as Judge Williams did. Um, and I think that's actually quite rare. Um, and I don't mean this as a knock on judges, but it's very common for judges to rely heavily on their clerks. There's a lot going on, um, and it's a lot easier to have the clerks know the details of the record and tell the judge, this is the part you should read. Judge Williams literally read the record. Um, when we gave him, I'll just give you another example of how Judge Williams used to judge, that I don't think this is how contemporary judges act in the same way, and, and I think it's lost, and, and it shows his habits as a scholar. Um, when we would give him a draft opinion, you would get an old library card, and you would sign the books up, line the books up like a site check um, from start to finish of every single opinion that, and, and any source that was cited in the draft opinion that you were giving Judge Williams. And the cart would go with the draft opinion. He would sit there and read every single case that was cited cover to cover in the hard copy reporter, um, along with everything else you cited, um, himself. Um, and I think that if one were to make a criticism of Judge Williams, it would be the last one you raised, which was he didn't always find himself bound by what the parties said. Um, I think he, you know, if it wasn't truly raised by the parties, I don't think Judge Williams would have raised it, but I think if there was a clearer, crisper way, uh, and I think this appears in a number of cases in his opinions, of, of analyzing a case, I think he might have raised it um, and not felt himself as bound by the briefs in the same way. I have a couple of examples in mind. There's a case, I think it's in 2019, where he has, in the opinion, a suggestion not raised by the parties that he tosses up, um, that when agencies are hearing, uh, when, when the DC Circuit or any court of appeals is hearing appeals by agencies, um, and the agencies are, the appeal is on a procedural matter um, that would vary by circuit, so that the agency could appeal, be appealed to the DC Circuit, depending on the case, could be also appealed maybe the Sixth Circuit, whatever happens to be, that you give deference to the agency to structure the rules of its own proceedings mm -hmm. um, so that you don't get a situation where the agency's rules procedurally are going to change based on what circuit um, it's going to. Um, I will candidly say I am 100% confident that that was not in the party's briefing. Um, but Judge Williams put it in his opinion. It didn't, wasn't case dispositive, um, but it was an, I think, important idea um, that he put out. So. I don't know if that answers your question. <laughs> It'll do. Thanks, Nathaniel. We have some time left for questions and as, or, or observations. Um, but as the microphones sort of make their way out, maybe we'll just take a moment. Uh, Mike, Nathaniel, do you have any other sort of personal uh, memories, reminiscences of Judge Williams that you want to add? He'd be horrified we were all wearing suits. <laughs> Not Mike. Um, <laughs> Did anybody bicycle here to the event today? Um, Mike? <coughs> all good. OK. Well, we, like I said, we have some time for questions. We'll start with Hadley Arcus here on, the, on my left-hand side. Thank you. I was tempted to raise a question with Mike about how, how Steve would have dealt with this um, moving away from McCulloch on uh, local governments taxing, taxing federal facilities. But I'll, I'll tuck that away for a moment. But I was, tra I was just drawn by... Mr. Zelinsky's point about uh, Steve seeing virtues and other, and other opinions on the other side and some of the defects on our own side. And I'm wondering, could you give us any notable example of that? And I'm wondering how that would have played out in some of these cases that have roiled our law and the country, whether it's um, Obergefell or Bostock or Roe versus Wade. Uh, 
what kind of example would you offer of where he would find some virtues on the other side that we might have been missing? Let me, let me give you the clearest example I think is criminal law. I think that Steve Williams' criminal law jurisprudence, if you put it up on a classic political science diagram, is far to the left. And I think you could trace that to Judge Williams' libertarianism, right? And one could do that, and I think that's right. I think he saw himself as shielding people from the arbitrary excesses of the state. But where I think conservative jurists, take Justice Alito and Justice Thomas as two examples, consistently in their jurisprudence, there's a consistent theme that tends to rule against criminal defendants across a number of different areas. Stephen Williams was not there. Um, and I think when you had, there are any number of criminal cases, and I find this in private practice, when I see a criminal case from the DC Circuit and it's 2-1, and it's a criminal law issue, either it's one Stephen Williams in dissent, or two Stephen Williams and then someone probably appointed by a Democratic president in the majority and somebody else in dissent. Um, so I think that's an example of that. Are you suggesting we get a libertarian side of the world to explain what's going on? I don't know. I mean, I want to be very careful because on those issues, I want to be very careful not to ascribe views to Judge Williams. What's the most significant part in bearing out the case that you care about? Well, so I think, so I actually, I, I think that I would suggest that there are a lot of cases we care about that occurred at the level of the DC Circuit in administrative law where Stephen Williams sought to find compromise on like statutory cases that matter to the parties quite a deal. Um, and I think you would find a situation, and I don't have great examples in front of you um, that are off the top of my head, but I, I hazard a guess that you can find cases where there were judges, because part of the problem is we don't have the internal correspondence to back this up, but there are judges who might have a very strong textualist view, for instance, and he's able to moderate them away toward a more workable solution. Judge Tatel talks about this in his um, portrait unveiling for Judge Williams in, um, I think it's 2007, 2006. And Judge Tatel says that Judge Williams wanted to publish at one point a list of the memos that went back and forth between the two chambers in a case. And I don't think the case was particularly notable, but he wanted to do so in order to show the public how judges sought to reach compromise and agreement um, on complex cases. Now, maybe it was reaching compromise by not deciding certain issues and ruling on a subsidiary point or something like that. But I think he sought genuinely as a judge to reach compromise. I think he would prefer a case to B3-0 if it were possible. He was very fond to pick another example of talking about a study by um, uh, a former dean of NYU, whose name is escaping me, head of ALI, um, environmental law scholar. Um, Ricky? Revez. Revez. So there's a Revez study that looks at the different DC Circuit judges and where they fall on environmental law cases. And he was quite proud of saying, and I think he said so publicly, that Revez found him to be like the exact median. I'm not actually sure that's what Revez found. Um, as a side note, but he liked to say, and he was very proud that that's where he was, um, or at least that's where Revez found him. So, thanks, Hadley. Any other questions or comments? Uh, next is John Harrison here in the middle. Thanks. Any any thoughts about the intellectual antecedents of Judge Williams' way of thinking about law, if they're not? the legal process, which was so important at Harvard when he was there, but if, 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 that's, if that's not it, is, is, there, is there a trend of American legal thought that he's part of, or, <laughs> or not? Mike? Um, <clears throat> I don't have a very clear sense of it, and John, I, I realize this is non-responsive, but I'll, I'll uh, try my my level best. My recollection of those days is that, um, I mean, and I'm now sort of talking about the 1980s, okay? Um, the intellectual debate on the conservative side was much more vibrant um, in terms of jurisprudence. And uh, there was, it, mind you, I mean, there was a great, much greater 
sort of preparedness to entertain those kinds of arguments of political economy, okay? Um, and so it would be, to my mind, a mistake to just single out Steve and say, He's, he was the only one, right? You read Frank Easterbrook's stuff from that period, it reads the same way. I mean, at, at least in spirit, um, if, if not in um, every detail. Th that's one thing I would say. And the second thing, and this is purely speculative, and I'm not sure uh, that this is entirely right, but there are passages in Steve Sachs's paper um, uh, that seem to agree with me, uh, I mean, uh, 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 agree with the following. Um, there used to be a, something in American jurisprudence that um, we used to call the grand style of constitutional argument. John Marshall, Joseph Story, that kind of stuff, right? Um, the founders were too wise to give us an imperfect constitution, and now we will make it at work as well as it will, right? That style of argument, I think, um, obviously that's long lost, and it's, it may not be recoverable, but there are powerful traces of that kind of an approach um, in, in Steve's thought. John, I'd love to hear you answer your own question if you want to venture, a, a, okay. Any others? Uh, sure, in the, the back row, Dan Shapiro. Hi, uh, I was just wondering uh, if you could expand a little on Judge Williams' jurisprudence uh, with regard to federalism and uh, preemption, particularly uh, as in the Mozilla situation with like when we're dealing with national economies or network situations, and maybe particularly how it might play out in uh, you know cafe preemption with the California waiver you know, bouncing around next door in Elira right now, how he might approach something like that. Yeah. Um, so uh, Jim Hoffman, actually, his paper mentions one of these cases. I think it's called ATA versus EPA. Jim will correct me if this is wrong. Uh, it deals with certain California truck standards, right? Um, where California basically ends up saying, hey, you know, <laughs> Any truck in the country, you know, you can't, I mean, if, if it violates our standards, it can't come into um, uh, California. It's an arbitrary and capricious case. It doesn't turn on these federalism considerations, as I recall the case. <clears throat> but he just mows them down, right? He was very, very uh, attuned to that, those, those kinds of um, uh, things. Um, I would say a lot of it would depend on what exactly is it that we're looking at here, right? The federal regulatory scheme, what exactly is it that the state is doing, okay? But I will tell you one thing with a fair bit of confidence. The, the cavalier attitude with which the Supreme Court has dealt with these kinds of questions, both at the statutory level and as uh, at the level of a sort of federal uh, constitutional common law, was I cannot imagine he would sign off on anything remotely like that. I mean, you practice in these areas, you can't get that stuff into the Supreme Court. They just say, you know, <laughs> California being mean to its neighbors, exporting its regulations to Brazil, we don't care. Cert denied, out of here, right? And the way these cases come up, uh, they don't sort of usually, I mean, unless there's some administrative law case and, and so there's a statutory overlay, they don't usually come up through the DC Circuit. So you get these idiot cases from the Ninth Circuit, you know, you say, oh my God, what did they do now, right? And then you have to be by now fearful and you have to tell the industry lawyers, look, before you crank that into the Supreme Court, think twice, because there is no telling what these people might be able to do with it, okay? And that's not Steve, right? I mean, he would have a very firm view on, on these things, and um, 
I mean, not any individual case um, that's currently pending or, or whatever. I mean, again, a lot would depend on how does this come up, what's this case actually about, and so on and so forth. But in terms of the general approach, the sort of lackadaisical attitude with which the courts now treat these questions was just completely alien to him. Well, on that hopeful note, uh, I think we've run out of time. So please join me in thanking our speakers.